So, Jeremy, um, your piece is uh, rather comprehensive, which is saying something because the amount of of conflict of interest here um, is extensive, and um, and and in many respects, it's unprecedented. I mean, is there anything that even comes close historically to something like this? Um, that's a really interesting question. The there is definitely history within the executive branch of there being conflicts of interest. Um, probably the most famous example is uh, the Teapot Dome scandal, which happened under the Warren G. Harding administration. But that I know of, at least, there hasn't ever really been something with the president himself. You've had a lot of presidents come into office fairly wealthy, but the extent of president-elect Trump's uh, business empire, the fact that he's a multi-billionaire, is really something that we've never seen before in the past. And even the presidents who have come into office for about the last 50 years or so, since uh, about Lyndon Johnson, um, most of them have done at least a, a ceremonial way of distancing themselves from their holding, either by putting what they have in a blind trust or by divesting and reinvesting their money in, you know, uh, uh, a fund that is broadly enough invested that you couldn't really uh, find the level of conflicts of interest that you're finding here. I mean, that is the 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 real sort of, I guess, stunning problem that um, that that Trump represents. You know, we had uh, Jimmy Carter put his uh, family's uh, peanut farm into mm-hmm. a trust is my understanding. Now, um, that's a pretty transparent situation, right? I mean, if Jimmy mm-hmm. Carter came out on day one and said, hey, you know, uh, we're going to subsidize peanuts now. Uh, we've been yep. subsidizing corn for, for a decade. We're actually going to start subsidizing peanuts because it's much healthier food. I think everybody would say, hey, wait a second. We know what's going on here. But Trump has holdings in so many places around the world and is uh, it, it, there is so uh, little transparency as to what's been going on that this creates a massive problem. And we should also say this does, is not limited to just Trump. He has now a, a cabinet full of billionaires, um, mm-hmm. and they all have the same subsidiary, I guess, questions. Let, for you, before we get into some of the, the ones in the piece that really stand out for me, for you, what are the most problematic, what are the most dramatic conflicts of interest that could come out of, of the Trump administration and have the most implications for the American public? Uh, for the American public is a difficult question, but in terms of the one that I think poses the biggest on-the-spot question is this whole deal with his hotel here in Washington, D.C., um, along with you know, one of the big questions coming in was, well, are we going to be seeing diplomats staying at Trump hotels? Are we going to see people buying his properties? And w- there's, there's yet to be anything that really points to that being provable, but there have been a couple events there. You know, the uh, embassy of Azerbaijan is going to be hosting one in a couple of weeks. Um, but the bigger question there, even more than, well, who's its clientele going to be? Because it's a luxury hotel. Of course, you're going to have wealthy people. Of course, you're going to have diplomats staying there. But the much bigger question has to do with this thing of the uh, General Services Administration and the way that um, he will be appointing people to the General Services Administration, which is what actually owns the building. He leases the hotel from the General Services Administration, and there's actually a clause in that contract that says that government employees who have any involvement with the GSA are not allowed to hold a lease for a building owned by the GSA because that might create a conflict of interest. And then on top of that, you have this question of the emoluments clause. Um, If you had told me that we would be talking about the Emoluments Clause, I would have not understood what you were talking about because I didn't know what the Emoluments Clause was about a month ago. Um, Uh, Nor did I. um, You know, it's kind of to me like if we were sitting around discussing, well, you know, discussing the Third Amendment, there's really not a lot 
that is known about it because there haven't been a lot of cases. But it definitely seems like a lot of these questions regarding his hotels, you know, the fact that he has property, a property in Georgia that had been stalled for, I believe, about five years. It was originally proposed back in 2010 or 2011. And then, you know, the permitting process got held up and held up and held up. And then reports come out a couple weeks ago that, well, now they're moving forward with it. Right. You know, Istanbul, he was on the phone with uh, President Erdogan, and he takes the time to bring up that he has a business partner in Istanbul who is the uh, owner of the Trump Towers in Istanbul. And, you know, the Emoluments Clause basically says if you are the President of the United States, you're not allowed to accept any gift that is directly given from a foreign government. And when you see something like, you know, President Duterte of the Philippines, his special envoy to the United States, which was appointed just before the election, is someone who's done a lot of business with Trump. Well, then, about a month later, you hear President Trump was on the phone with Duterte and praised Duterte's war on drugs, which is something that has caused a lot of concern in the international community because of its brutality. So, to me, I really, I think that, you know, that emoluments clause issue, the question of can he be 100 percent objective in his dealings with foreign leaders is the one that I think uh, could end up being the biggest question. I mean, question, it also could be the greatest danger, right, uh, to uh, the United States uh, standing in the world, because um, if I mean, there's two edge, uh, two sides of this, right? I mean, uh, it's one thing. Look, it's obviously corrupt if uh, Donald Trump is getting uh, uh, building permits for his his, uh, his real estate partners uh, in various countries around the world because of favors he's doing for these leaders of these countries. And but the there are genuine implications to the president mm-hmm. of the United States getting on the phone with uh, a leader of a country. You know, the, the, all of these diplomatic uh, cues mean something within uh, a, a foreign country, you know, both domestically from their perspective, but also it sends a message. And there is a, a basic understanding in the world that it's not, you know, that uh, it's almost as if like, well, he wouldn't do this just to enrich himself. This is an indication of what U.S. policy is. And mm-hmm. for all intents and purposes, it could very well be a policy. Like, you, if you want to sh- mow down people in your country because you're using drugs, go ahead by all means. Uh, and this is one of the issues that came up, obviously, with the Taiwan call. Um, let's touch on that. We've got to take a break here in a moment. Let's touch on that Taiwan call, why that could be so problematic going forward. Um, almost... Uh, regardless of which way the Chinese uh, took that mm-hmm. call. And then I also want to talk about a couple of things that stood out for me. Fanny and Freddie and uh, the, the relationships and the entanglements behind uh, uh, Fanny and Freddie and also uh, the, the incredible uh, opportunity for conflicts of interest mm-hmm. with the billionaires in his cabinet who all have similar type of holdings in the country, outside of the country, how it will impact their decision-making process. we got to take a quick break. Sam Seater, Ring of Fire Radio. We'll be right back with Jeremy Vanuk right after this.